to those who don't know me i'm particularly delighted to also welcome uh, mr chandra hasan you're coming here for the very first time i'm happy you're here so thank you for coming mr ramakrishnan who is the focus of attention this afternoon or his book will be the focus of attention colonel hari haran who's going to moderate the discussion and of course professor surya narayan whose book focused on the indo indonesia relations during the days leading to indonesia's independence together in struggle was released about 2 months ago and it was really after that book launch here in madras that mr ramakrishnan came and met me one of these days and spoke about having a similar discussion on his book an ethnic accord an ethnic conflict and an accord and i said yes but then he said he was traveling to colombo and jaffna and kandy so i said why don't we have that after you make your trip because the trip was also going to be about the book and i think now he's come back finding that a little more useful maybe perhaps some additional inputs more useful inputs for today's discussion i'll just quickly introduce you to the panelists and then colonel hari haran will take over after ramakrishnan speaks a little about the book or introduces his book Mr Chandra Hasan is the son of the iconic leader of the Tamils of Sri Lanka SJV Chelvanayagam who's popularly called Tande Chelva despite hailing from an extremely privileged background Mr Chandra Hasan chose to work for refugees ever since the 1983 black july erupted in Sri Lanka subsequently he migrated to India and founded the organization for elim refugees rehabilitation which has offices in Sri Lanka and in India His commitment to the cause of the refugees is so deep that he has been working for them even though the refugees from Sri Lanka living in Tamil Nadu are no longer in the limelight. Mr Chandra Hasan began his career as an advocate in the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka but his passion for the Tamil cause and people led him to embark into politics by joining the Federal Party which later got renamed as the Tamil United Liberation Front or the TULF. he had served the party as the legal secretary and he like his father believes that a gandhian approach is needed to address the tamil question professor surinayan of course was founder director and later senior professor at the uh, center for south and southeast asian studies at the university of madras and uh, he specializes in those areas as well as in history politics and and international relations he has a doctorate in international relations from the indian school of international relations in new delhi and uh, he taught at the marathwada university in aurangabad at the bombay university he taught at the northeast uh, hill university in shillong and he is also an adjunct faculty here at the asian college of journalism so It's a pleasure having you again professor. Colonel Hari Haran of course specializes in in military intelligence in anti-terrorism and counter-insurgency operations for most part of his 28 years when he served the uh, when he served the Indian military. And uh, what is significant is that he is also headed the intelligence unit of the IPKF during 1987 1990 and during the period thereafter of course he was heading the madras management association for about a decade or so and then he writes in several newspapers leading newspapers here here in india and in sri lanka So thank you for agreeing to moderate the discussion Colonel. I appreciate that. 
Ramakrishnan, of course, I'll start by saying that he's the son of Mr. Ashoka Mitran, who perhaps is one of the most influential writers in Tamil literature, and whose writings stand out for their simplicity and clarity. Ramakrishna himself, when he was young, he says when he was 11 years old, he had published a book in Tamil, a short story, which appeared in a Tamil weekly. And I suppose it was not surprising that he got into journalism. He has a postgraduate in commerce as well as in history. And he joined the Hindu in 1992, which makes him cross the silver jubilee mark in the newspaper. So congratulations for that. 26 years and still going strong. Of course, he's received some awards. He's won a fellowship. But again, what's most significant is that during 2015, March to August 2016, he was deputed by the Hindu to be the correspondent based in Colombo for Sri Lanka and the Maldives. And I have a feeling that a lot of what he's written in the book is based on his innings there. And during his innings there, he also interacted very closely with Maitripala Sirisena, Ranil Vikramasinghe, and other political leaders. And uh, he also has met a cross-section of people. So before Colonel Hariharan takes over, let me invite Ramakrishnan to say a few words about the book. Let me thank at the outset all the panelists, Mr. Chandra Hassan, Professor Surya Narayan, and Colonel Hariharan for having readily consented to take part in this discussion. There are essentially three reasons why I have chosen to write a book on a topic that apparently does not excite many here, I mean in Tamil Nadu or India. The reason number one, it's about members of my fraternity, journalists. The proportion of uh, Indian journalists writing books, even in English, is low quite, and, and, quite, and uh, much less in their respective mother tongue. My paper, The Hindu, has been having its um, journalists stationed in Colombo for over 30 years, and I had suggested to some of my colleagues to write books on Sri Lanka. But after having served in Colombo, if I were to make the same suggestion now or in future, I should have written a book. This is why this book. The reason number two, it's about the relevance of the subject. The 87 Indo Lanka Peace Accord and the consequent 13th Amendment <coughs> to the Constitution of Sri Lanka continue to be debated in any discourse on the Tamil question in Sri Lanka, and they constitute such a reference point in the contemporary history of Sri Lanka that even the staunchest critics of the Accord cannot ignore them. With all the ills, weaknesses, and shortcomings, the system of provincial councils in Sri Lanka, an offshoot of the Accord, has come to stay. Oh, sorry. As recent as December 2016, seven chief ministers, all Sinhalese, had opposed a move of the central government, which they had argued came in the way of their functioning. This speaks of the strength of the Accord or the Amendment. So regardless of the fate of the ongoing process of constitutional reforms in Sri Lanka, the provisions of the 13th Amendment, or their essence, continue to occupy the attention of those who are involved in the making of the new constitution. As far as India is concerned, the popular perception of the, about the Accord is that it is a dead letter. However, what must be acknowledged that it, it remains the only instrument through which India, if it desires, can intervene in any effort or initiative that will have a lasting bearing on Sri Lankan Tamils. It is not without reason that governments of the two countries have not publicly renounced or abandoned the accord. The next week marks the ninth anniversary of the end of the armed conflict between the Sri Lankan government and militants from the northern and eastern provinces. As former president of Sri Lanka, Chandrika Bandaranaike Kumar Tunga has often said, which I have quoted in my book, the mere absence of war is not peace. Peace entails much more than victory in war. According to Chandrika, peace demands humility and sacrifice from all. 
It requires the will to comprehend the root causes of a conflict and seek solutions to them. It is in this context that the essential features of the Accord and the 13th Amendment, which I earnestly believe can and would provide the basis of any solution to the Tamil question. The reason number three, it's about misconceptions that continue to surround the Accord. I have challenged some of them. One such notion is that the Accord or agreement was imposed on Sri Lanka. It is true that Sri Lanka had signed the pact after New Delhi did air dropping of food packets over Jaffna on June 4, 1987. But J.R. Jayavadne, the first executive president of Sri Lanka, had entertained the idea of getting India to underwrite his country's security well before July 87, when the accord was signed. Some of our foreign policy experts argue that Tamil Nadu was not a great factor behind the accord, but I don't think so. The thought of adverse con consequences of continued activities of militants on Tamil Nadu did bother Indian policymakers in the 1980s. Finally, on the roles of Indira Gandhi and Rajiv in the Sri Lankan Tamil question, Rajiv is now seen as a file leader, whereas his mother is viewed among several sections of Sri Lankan Tamils as one who had genuine concern for them. But in my analysis, it was Rajiv and not Indira Gandhi who had genuinely wanted to solve the ethnic problem. Indira Gandhi had used the problem for her political agenda, domestic and foreign. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, firstly, uh, I am uh, quite familiar with uh, Sri Lanka, not because I was with the Indian peacekeeping force or I, I am a, what to call a dubious privilege of being a specialist on terrorism and insurgency. But uh, due to my family links from 1954 uh, onwards, uh, uh, this is uh, important because I am a biased guy, because I know the history when uh, Tamils start talking of Sri for autumn or uh, um, any other aspect. I am fully in picture because uh, Tamils, Singhalis, uh, Tamils on both sides and Singhalis believe in arguing more than in action. This is what I have seen during the last, uh, I, I suppose, about, um, since my 14th year, up to another, uh, you can say another 65 years, nearing 70, I should say. Why I am mentioning this is, this is a highly polemic subject. In Tamil Nadu, if you honestly write about it, there are no publishers. Many people ask me, why you don't write? I said, I don't want people throwing stones in my old age because they have, don't have a clue about the issue. So I am actually very glad uh, Ramakrishnan has written this in Tamil. I want to mention this because it is worth reading. I hope actually it should be serialized. Uh, visually, now the reading attention is so low, I think, I suppose it is reduced to 8 to 15 seconds. It should be brought to, it can be, it can be, produce a beautiful documentary. I had suggested this to a Sri Lankan, um, uh, old LTT guy who participated in the killing of Sri Sabharatnam. He has written a book about it, about this. I suggested to him, you tell the French TV, they will produce. Nobody will touch this here. Because we have this bias, me included, to take a dispassionate look. He has managed to take a dispassionate look. So I actually congratulate him. Three issues I want to focus. One is, why did we intervene? May the, not only Cyril Ranatunga, uh, general, who, who was a general at that time when we when, uh, when, the, when we forced a ceasefire uh, in 1987? Uh, then 
almost 80% of sri lankan army believes but for india's intervention prabhakaran would have been finished but they have not understood the core issue it is not prabhakaran it is the issue that produced prabhakaran so uh, he has he has elaborated on this i think if you uh, i would encourage you to buy a copy to understand it because the complexities each one it is like the seven blind men describing the elephant each one has tried to see overall i feel we intervened basically uh, not for tamils rajiv had great sympathy for tamils the sri lankan tamils expected india to do a 1971 but it is the uh, crisis in afghanistan that india had to intervene in sri lanka to prevent americans from getting too big a foothold i think this is one of the core issues because i think uh, at that time uh, now i think his minister of state mr hardeep puri also had mentioned about the uh, american entry into the waters uh, why i am mentioning is we should see on the macro issues that make countries take policy decisions this has been brought out quite nicely by him he is not judgmental Ex- except though i don't agree with some of his conclusion whether indira or rajiv who are more kind but what is the result is my point always the in rajiv's time i definitely i agree with him i am a guy who wrote who had the opinion of the view 13th amendment badly worded legally unsound i am not saying this many legal experts have quoted i am not quoting uh, sri lankan commentators our own commentators in spite of all this to this day it is one thing all have agreed that it is still sustaining tamil aspirations to look forward i think uh, uh, mr samadhan spoke in the book release uh, in uh, colombo when this book was released ramakrishnan's uh, book there he highlighted the need for india the sri lankan tamils need india to get their equal rights i keep telling this to sri lankan tamils you may abuse i get so many abusive mail uh, so i am quite familiar from canada and from france and uh, this thing so i i know their perspective i am not talking out of the thin air i keep replying each abusive mail you are wrong that is how you lost the war i keep telling them you must see where will we go forward this is one aspect i appreciate in the book another aspect is about the ipkf performance itself i myself have been a critic it is uh, it was a ill conceived mission ill advised by the government because it could not decide same thing how to handle there was no plan b how to handle prabhakaran if he doesn't agree to surrender his arms why he refused to surrender there is a totally a different issue and army was allowed to negotiate with him how can army can negotiate with him to surrender the issues are political so this issue particularly uh, the the triggers that led to the confrontation i think uh, there are two triggers one is the dilipans uh, fast for whatever reasons that took place uh we should have paid more attention i thought because i as an intelligence man paid full attention at that time because i could see early warning that this is not going to be a walk over so we knew exactly when the fire went off because everybody is a civilian who are the guys there uh and the other is this 12 
leaders of LTT, actually there were 17 leaders, 13 were caught because they had firearms with them. One, he did not bite the capsule, cyanide capsule, the other 12 bit into it and died. I was present at that location at that time. So I think the point about Indian Army guarding them, it never guarded them. We had specific instruction not to provide a security for them. Only we were guarding the outer perimeter because we didn't want it to spill over into because we were very close by. This was in Palali airfield and I was a witness to this. And I don't know who expected J.R. Jayavardhana to accept their release. J.R. will not. 168, the, the bus, the Anuradhapura bus incident, 168 bhikkhus, young bhikkhus, women, children were blasted by LTT as a retaliation in Nainathiyu. 40 uh, Tamil women and children were killed. This was the, the this Polyandran was involved. So, how do we expect them to release it? It was too much to expect. And LTT told us, actually, he told me that you will take 1200, 12 when we, Steel and Konami wanted me to be present, when the bodies were handed over by them. At that time, Mataya told me, you will carry 1,200 of your bodies. I told him, don't fight with the Indian Army. It has been fighting Nagas for 50 years. It will carry on. It is not a question of whether it is competency or not. India, in insurgency, sheer numbers win. That is what it is. Ultimately, this is what happened in 4th Elam War. LTT strength dwindled. Still, economy increased. This uh, aspect also is quite well covered, <coughs> and also the 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 what you call the slugfest uh, between the the political slugfest between the the politicians. The L LTT has the, the problem is LTT had no politician. The others when they were fighting. Uh, these people. They were fighting actually. India was a guy who had no rule book how to bring a solution. So it was totally ill-conceived. Last one point I would like to mention. I actually like his positive note. Where do we go from forward? No use talking about good old days. They were not good old days. They were bad old days. So, how do we go forward? There is the constitutional exercise going on. It is not a question of whether it is embedded in the constitution or not. Those steel accounts are greatest litigants. Per capita, I think they file more cases, fundamental right cases than anybody else. Uh, so, if you want statistics, I can tell you how many, the biggest thief also files fundamental right case in uh, Sri Lanka. That shows, of course, mature democracy. But the point is, where do we go? How long are we going to keep on arguing? So, when people told me, uh, Hari, are you supporting taking this uh, the genocide that was carried out? I said, do what? Do homework see whether it comes within UN definition of genocide. No use rabble-rousing here. See the definition. How do we take it to ICC? They asked me, the political parties also. I said, collect evidence. It took 12 years when nearly 2 million people were killed in uh, Rwanda. So collect data, do homework. No use simply shouting about it. This we do very well. So, his future, he has been quite, uh, one, though in other things he had been diplomatic, 
on their future, he has given a positive course of uh, what all can be done. And uh, I am for, in, they asked me also, uh, uh, IPKF violated human, I said kindly prosecute, take a case, collect evidence. I said war has changed, now accountability is more. In 87 it was not, but that is no excuse. My life massacre was made accountable, though Americans have continued bombing. So I am saying there is, we must take action. This is, but we must take, we must look legal. This Americans do quite well. They also publish Amnesty International reports. They also have Human Rights Watch. And they also don't take action. Government ignores. So anything you feel conscious, you must do homework and do it. So I, with this, I will stop. I will ask uh, Mr. Chandra Hassan. Of course, Mr. Chandra Hassan, uh, I am actually uh, scared of talking about Sri Lankan history because uh, he has been part of the Sri Lankan history, uh, the post-independence history. So I am a little scared. But sir, you can shoot me down anytime. I am a soldier accustomed to duck bullets. <laughs> I have survived so long. <laughs> Over to Mr. Chandras. I'm sure uh, we will have no hesitation in uh, speaking. Uh, frankly, you can speak frankly. I, I can see the, these are all people who are interested. In, uh, uh, Tamil, so no need to be diplomatic. <laughs> Moment. A small commercial before he starts. Uh, the book is available, I believe, at a discount of 150. I think you should buy it. It's worth it. Actually, uh, I hope he comes with an English translation. You must do. Thank you. I was wondering whether I should speak in Tamil or in English, but then it appears that uh, I think uh, the discussion has been going on in English and uh, we should uh, continue in English. First of all, I will take over from where Colonel Hariharan left. Something that appeared to me as important was that this book should also be brought out in English because it's a treasure trove. We've been working, uh, I was perhaps five years old when my father was elected member of parliament and as a child I stood in the podium with him. So I've seen through everything. But it's very rare that people can make a presentation which is very uh, holistic and which can be a foundation for progress. So these were some of the points that were made. The, why I say it's a treasure trove is the fact that he's done so much of work in collecting the information, correlating it and bringing it together. And it's an issue which is going to continue. And if you look for some material to support someone who wants to do something meaningful, then you would find it difficult to find uh, books which are uh, more or less giving you the background in a very neutral way in which it, it has been presented. This soft journalism, something that attracted me was how he beautifully gets the idea across. <coughs> it's more powerful than the hard journalism. He says, this is uh, in the no nudiya karathu, that's all. But that it penetrates because it's not being pushed. At, you don't have any resistance. It makes an impact. It's something that is new, that uh, it is useful to get ideas across in a way in which it takes people to think and move forward. Now the 
issue that I was wanting to raise was the need to see what are the areas in which there can be some more improvement. One of the improvements that needs to be made is that, like there have been some cornerstones, Bandar Naka Chalvanagam agreement. That's been the first major agreement, and uh, you'll see the connection between that and the Industrial Aka Accord. Then the Dadi Sainanayaka Chalvanayagam agreement. Thereafter, you will find that the constitution that came in 1972, that was a big setback because the pendulum swung the opposite way at a time when Sri Mahavo Bandaranaka came in with a very big majority and uh, coalesced with the left parties, the Communist Party, the LSSP and so on, but came out with a constitution which is a majoritarian constitution, more or less the pendulum swinging backwards. Now, the people's movement and the way people move is something that needs to be also brought in, which is something that is important. Interestingly, when the pendulum swung backwards, we had the reaction of the Tamil community sitting back and thinking, how can we respond? So you have a situation where you've gone through so much, and uh, after which two agreements were abdicated, and they end up with a constitution which was meant to be bringing all the people together, a constituent assembly is set up, all are asked to participate, parliament is constituted into a constituent assembly. And the Tamil voice was there, they were not accommodating the voice, and at a point of time the Tamil parties came together in the north at Valvaditre and said there are six basic ones. You would probably remember the epic of Mahabharata. Finally, it ended up with five houses. It was similar to that. And that letter which was written to Sri Mahavo Bandar Nayaka had no response. And the Tamil uh, members of parliament had to come out of parliament. And thereafter, They boycotted the further sittings because there was no purpose. And interestingly, the debate, Sri Mahavo Bandaranaka challenged Mr. J. my father by saying that we will, we know what the Tamils want. We are resp representing the Tamils. So my father's response was, if so, I will resign my parliamentary seat as a token. Let you, you can have an election and see what the Tamil people need, have to say, whether you need to accommodate the views of the aspirations of the Tamils in the new constitution. This was not responded to. He resigns his seat. The by-elections are not held for three years. And uh, within these three years, she loses the support of the left parties and she becomes weak. And after three years, she responds to the letter and says, let us talk, by which time it was too late. The parliamentary by-election, the first time the thought of Tamil Ilam was something that came up in that by-election, in desperation. And having come up in desperation, the, after winning the elections, the pressure was to have the Watakota resolution where the community decided to go it alone. The movement of people is also something that needs to go along. Because you've done a wonderful job, it's a treasure trove. We need to take that aspect also in. There is another aspect which is interesting. The cornerstone, Bandaranaka Chalvanayam agreement, the other agreements, 
then the constitution, then the Jayabodhana's response to the Tamililam demand. He says that the Tamils, for these reasons, have sought to ask for a separate state. I will adequately respond, and he comes to power. Then the constitution making, there was more space given, but then accommodation was not to the acceptance of the Tamil aspirations, and it didn't, it fell short of the. But the next scenario we would see is that originally the pro problem was seen to be tackled as an internal Sri Lankan issue. Federal Party, the SLFP, the UNP, discussions, negotiations, Satyagraha movement, and the process of uh, non-violent struggle was going on. Frustrations, and after the constitution that was brought in 72 and there was no accommodation, the people the need to take it outside the country. And then comes the first move, Mr. Chalmanayakam comes to India and meets the Tamil leaders in Tamil Nadu. Until then, there was no effort to take it outside the country. Second phase is to take it, look at support from outside. Having worked on that mission, then the 83 program brought in the entire world. It stunned the world, shocked the world, because it was a program where the government had planned and executed a, a genocidal attack on the Tamils, with ministers of government also being involved in the process. So it became internationalized. And then the next phase, now what is the cornerstone? Is the international commitment made by the Sri Lankan government at the UNHRC. So you've made a commitment to India, it is going to be a foundation stone for further discussions. And that has been taking into consideration various aspects that are relevant and the issues that had to be taken in order to resolve the issue. Further, it goes further and now it has become internationalized and the UNHRC, the UN system has come in and that is a commitment they may take time, they may not adhere to it, but the fact is they are bound to it and a new phase has begun. So even if we go beyond the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord and the 13th Amendment, the implementation and security aspects, etc., have to be taken care of. Mr. Ramakrishnan has very well brought out the fact that apart from the uh, division of powers and the uh, 13th Amendment, the provincial councils, there was the parity of status that was adopted, tried. And to some extent, Tamil was made an official language. And on paper, equality of status. Implementation has its own de de defects. Mahindra Rajapaksa was strong on in that issue because he, as a president of Sri Lanka, learned Tamil, continued to have a tutor, goes to the UN and speaks in Tamil. He also saw to it that all public servants they could join in their mother tongue, but they would be given an additional inducement of 25,000 rupees over a period of time to learn the other language. So they were more favorable to the accommodation of the Tamil language because they were singular speaking. But when you have the English-speaking UNP, you will find that 
the language factors are not taken care of and it's during the UNP regime and the current regime, it's on the back burner. But the point made that there is a step forward as a result of the 13th Amendment and the Indo Sri Lanka Accord was that Tamil has also been made an official language. And practically speaking, the Tamil people in Tamil areas are able to use that language. He has made an important point that it is also necessary. There are Tamils all over the country and the use of Tamil in other places has its own shortcomings. But more important is something that everyone needs to keep a, uh, give a special uh, thought to. The ethnic conflict was actuated by the fact that the persons of Indian origin were disenfranchised and decitizenized in 48. Indo-Sri Lanka Accord also took into consideration that factor and it was decided that you bring in the representatives of the Tamils of the plantation Tamils and that is to be resolved. And credit must be given to Sri Lanka that they have resolved the issue. They have brought in the 2003 enactment which more or less settled the issues as to whoever chose to go to India and had gone to India were Indian citizens. Everyone else who remained, they were persons of Indian origin, were accommodated as Sri Lankan citizens. But there was an anomaly, the refugees. Those who in 1990 crossed from Sri Lanka to India and were back in India as refugees but were of Sri Lankan origin or persons of Indian origin from Sri Lanka. Because the enactment went on the basis that you had to have continued residence from 1964, the Sastri-Sri Mahavar agreement period. So those who had been out, had chosen to come to India were left out. With the involvement or the bringing in the JBP that was corrected in 2009 and persons who were in the refugee camps in Tamil Nadu, persons of Indian origin, were for all legal concerns accepted as persons entitled to Sri Lankan citizenship and there was a uh, step taken which is a forward step. I don't think you have an example in any other part of the world where the whole issue of statelessness of persons of Indian origin was taken into consideration and solved. So that will be an additional factor in the benefits of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord and some of the justifications to say that it's a cornerstone and it needs to be taken further. So I think I have brought in some points for the time being to enrich the discussion and I'll get back to my seat and if necessary come in at a later stage. There's just one thing that I was keen to reflect on. Being tempted by Harry Haran, Colonel Harry Haran, the issue of Mr. Colonel Harry Haran taking up the position that there are no leaders. But then he also made the point, you go to uh, France, you go to Germany, you can get people. There are people who are interested and we need to get to them and see that this process is made. At least we must provide the information and Colonel Harry Haran is a treasure trove of so much which needs to be shared to justify the participation of the Indian peacekeeping force from a <laughs> person coming from the uh, Sri Lankan Tamil community 
you will not find people who justify the role of the IPKF. It has its shortcomings, but the fact remains it must be tested not as an army, but as a peacekeeping operation. Peacekeeping operation of a party who negotiated the settlement, which is very unique. And you must not put them through the acid test. It's not fair. Because there are too, so, so much of pros and cons. And it is very unfair that there has been so much a criticism of the shortcoming and not bringing out the points which today most emphatically the concept of the Northeast was be, more or less became a salient point because of the involvement of the IPK. These are not relating to incidents, but the theme peacekeeping operation, and you also back it with a force which took the process forward, but unfortunately, we, the Sri Lankans, are unique. The first good step that was taken to bring the Sri Lankan government and the LTT to talk together, at that meeting, Premadasa and Prabhaharan decided to kick the IPKF out. That was a sad story. I think you have that has to be, someone needs to bring it out. Here in Tamil Nadu, nobody will know about it. Because that was a mental... So, uh, I don't mind writing. Of course, there are, I have international audience for whom I write, generally. Rather than local audience, I think I should write. I agree with you. Thank to you. Set, <laughs> Thank you. Our Professor Surya Narayan. Uh, one thing I like about uh, Professor Surya Narayan is uh, he. So, well, no, there are many things I don't like also. Is <laughs> why I mention only likes is that he uh, pro uh, presents a very false uh, frontage that uh, he is very he is very knowledgeable and one great advantage he has is. He views it in the historical perspective of not merely Sri Lanka, of the region as a whole. This is, uh, this is a great, uh, it, it provides a, a broader view of the issues. So over to Professor Sunana. I associate myself with Colonel Hariharan and Chandra Hasan extending my heartiest felicitation to the hero of the day for bringing out a very absorbing book. Though Tamil is my mother tongue, it's extremely difficult for me to read a book consecutively. So this book I was able to understand and grasp thanks to two friends, Michael Wallen of the UNHCR and Mr. Subramaniam. Uh, who helped me in understanding all the nuances of the book. There is one aspect of life where one should not practice family planning, that is in writing. And I hope and I wish more strength to your pen. I'm also happy that uh, two people who are actively involved in Sri Lanka are present here. I'm only an academic. I watch the things from distance and theorize. It had its own deficiencies. I happened to meet Chandrahasan and Balasingam once when they were staying in Indiranagar. Introduced me to Prabhagaran as Perasri of Sudhinarayan. He immediately said, Balasingam will speak to you. Because he knows the process can confused. Uh, whereas here are two people who are involved. Chandra Hassan, as Colonel Hedigan said, is a part of history. Of course, he did not speak about his role. In fact, his first major foray in Tamil Nadu, Sam can correct me, was in 1982 in the Pondi Bazaar 
incident when Umama Heshrin Prabhakaran shot at each other and were arrested. And the Sri Lankan government announced a big reward to the Tamil Nadu government for arresting these two people and asking for their extradition to Sri Lanka. Sandra Hassan came and then he said, if you send them back, they will be killed. And he got a hero's reception at that time. And uh, New Delhi adopted a very clever stand. They committed a crime in our country. We will try them according to the law of the land. And then consider your extradition. And the two criminals jumped bail and went to Sri Lanka. I met Chandra Hassan for the first time in January 1983, when I did a one-month field work in Sri Lanka. I was staying in Vellavati in Ramakrishna Mission. Chandra Hassan came and took me to his house and where I met Nirmala and also his very efficient junior colleague, Surya Kumari. At that time, he was, as he spoke, he was very persuasive. He was persuasively arguing at that time that the Tamils and the Sinhalese cannot live together. That was his attitude at that time. That continued for a long time. I also met him in Saturday review office in Jaffna, where I met Radin Phillips, Prasachilin Kadragama and others who were involved with much Shivanayagam, who did it through the Saturday review and all. Uh, so, history of Sri Lanka cannot be understood unless you understand the role played by all these people, including Colonel Hadihari. Suppose I was writing this book, how would I have tackled it? In fact, in 1927, Gandhiji visited Ceylon. He went there on the invitation of Handi Perimbanayagam of the Jaffna Youth Congress. That's the only phase where they were taking inspiration from the Indian national movement and practicing non-cooperation. Gandhiji, being a Baniya, told Handi Padmanagam, you must contribute 100,000 rupees to the Khadi and Prohibition Fund, then only I will come. They assured, and they gave more than 100,000 to Gandhiji. In the course of his visit to Ceylon, Gandhiji made an observation that Ceylon is India's dot the state is India's daughter. All aspects of Sri Lankan life, its history, its culture, its religion, its demography, its dress, its cuisine, all have been influenced by India. In fact, according to Professor Indra Bala, who was Professor for History and Archaeology in the Jaffna University, India and Ceylon were together, and there was movement of people in early times. And he says to look at Sri Lanka as a different country from South India is wrong. Because so much of influence is there. But we are a big country. Sri Lanka is a small country. Population of Sri Lanka is one third that of Tamil Nadu. So they fear India. They think that. They had been conquest from India and therefore once again will be conquered. And uh, at the time of independence they thought that the best insurance against in, in Indian invitation was to enter into a defense arrangement with Britain. So we are the Anglo-British agreement. In fact, John Kotlawala said the day that British leave Ceylon, Ceylon will come under Indian domination. So on the one hand, there is this understanding of cult indebtedness to India, shall we say, love for India. At the same time, fear of India, which means hating India. So it is love-hate relation. I can give you a few illustrations, but before that I want to mention another point. In the recent years, there is a new theory in international relations called responsibility 
to protect R to P. It is propounded by the former Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans, taken up by the Canadian Prime Minister, and the United Nations passed General Assembly passed a resolution that it will be one of our objective. What does responsibility to protect means? That means if genocide takes place, if there is mass annihilation of innocent people, the international community cannot remain quiet. And the international community has to influence, has to bring about change through persuasion first, Samadhana Bhedadanda, and finally, if necessary, through humanitarian intervention. Our policy towards Sri Lanka, though the concept of R2P came only in about a decade ago, we have been following this. I'll give you a few illustrations. Some of them have been mentioned by the author, but they have not gone into detail. The first one was in April 1971 when Ceylon faced the threat from the Sinhalese educated youth that the Janata Vimukti Paramuna, Sri Lanka did not, have, Ceylon did not have an army at that time. They asked for external help and the country which spontaneously responded to Mrs. Bandarnaga's request was India. Our force planes went from Bangalore and our naval forces went from Chennai and from Cochin to safeguard Colombo, because there were rumors at that time the North Koreans are going to help the JVP. And uh, Mrs. Bandarnaga took action against the JVP. Many of them were detained. Six months later, how did Sri Lanka repay India's spontaneous help? Six months later, the East Pakistani crisis developed in a big way. We had banned the overflights of Pakistani Air Force from, from West Pakistan to East Pakistan. So the Pakistani planes and their soldiers in civilian clothes were going from Karachi to Colombo and then to Dhaka. I got the number of flights, the number of persons who went. This is how they repaid the gratitude and all. Take the case of the days following the India-Sri Lanka call 87. The IPKF was sent to Sri Lanka on the invitation of the Ajayarabhani. At heavy cost of men and materials, the IPK was able to bottle up the LTT guerrillas in the jungle of Wani. That enabled the Sri Lankan army to withdraw itself in the south and tackle the second JVP threat. It was called as the Bhishana Samaya, the days of terror, when the Sri Lankan army butchered the Sinhalese youth. Those rivers of exquisite beauty in southern part of Sri Lanka, Kaliniya Ganga and Mahavili Ganga, were clogged with dead bodies and foamed with blood. That saved the Sri Lankan army, tackled the problem. Then what happened? Prabhagarin and Premadasa came together. LTT was given life by Premadasa, and the common thing was that IPKF should get out. The IPKF got out, but the honeymoon did not last long. Premadasa had to pay the wages of sin, and he himself became victim to the cult of the bomb and the bullet, which was perfected by the LTT. The During the 1970s, Mrs. Bandar Naira period, one of the major foreign policy objectives of Ceylon was to get the Indian Ocean as a zone of peace. With the support of the non-aligned world, especially India, they were able to get a resolution passed in the UN General Assembly. The objective is, should be that the superpowers should be dropped and Indian Ocean should be declared as a zone of peace. But when we imploded the nuclear device in Pokhran in 1974. Sri Lanka changed its attitude. Shirley Amarasinghe, one of their astute diplomats, said, we do not want a superpower by a nearby power. And what is more, 1977 onwards, the UN said, you convene a conference of literal states 
For many years, Hamid, the foreign minister, used to tell in the United Nations, we'll convene a conference, we'll convene a conference. And I wrote at that time, this Hamid's repeated statement that we'll convene the conference reminds me of the famous lines of W.H. Auden. Beware of words, beware of words. For with words we lie, we say peace when we mean war. When the IPK withdraw Lekhanlal Malhotra, my friend was the High Commissioner there. I used to meet him after his retirement in the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library when I was visiting Professor in JNU. And uh, he told me that how obsessed Premadasa was to get the IPK out. Deshmukh was secretary to the Rajiv Gandhi event and met him. And uh, Premadasa told him IPK has to withdraw. If IPK does not withdraw, I'll commit suicide. In fact, he had mentioned all this, this in his autobiography, My Days, in Sri Lanka. And this is the sort of hatred that he had. When tsunami struck in 2004, December 2004, immediately we had Commodore Vasan is here, he knows about it. Within 24 hours, we rushed. Our troops, our rescue teams, Colombo Harbour was gutted, which was removed. Railway lines were restored to Gaul. And we wanted to extend help to the north and the east, uh, which was hit very hard. But IPK will not, al uh, sorry, LTT will not allow us to send our forces. So Nirupama Rao, who was the High Commissioner at that time, told me, though we wanted to send a lot of help, to the Tamils in the north, LTT was not prepared to cooperate with us and we could not extend the type of help that we wanted. Now the wheel turned full circle. In 2000, the elephant pass fell to the LTT and they were knocking at the door of Jaffna. Even the JVP, which was opposed to the IPK present there, even JVP wanted India to intervene, help them to prevent the capture of Jaffna by that. But New Delhi had learned the lessons. The only thing that they told the foreign minister was, if your armed forces are encircled by the LTT forces, then we will do rescue operation. Otherwise, no more direct intervention and all. Uh, I'll take five more minutes. In 1983, Balasingham, October 1983, Balasingham came to the university and met me. Somebody would have told him that I'm interested in Sri Lanka and all. He came to me, introduced himself, and gave me a lecture for one hour. What is the population of Sri Lanka and all? I'm a patient listener. Sometimes I can listen without hearing it. That's a different matter. So he gave me a lecture and all and said that it is in India's interest that a Tamil Elam comes. He obviously forgot that there were many Sri Lankan Tamils who were working against India. Starting with Sir Kandaya Vaidinathan, who was advisor to D.S. Senanayaga when he rendered the Indian Tamil stateless, to those who voted with the government and all those things. I, I do not want to go in. Then I asked him, Barsing, I will ask you a question. Today, New Delhi is unhappy with JR. New Delhi is unhappy with JR because JR is following a foreign policy to the detriment of India. A factor that you have brought out in your book. But if Colombo is prepared to go along with India on the foreign policy objectives, if Colombo is prepared to follow a foreign policy, in consonance with New Delhi, then the two will join together and you will be placed between a nutcracker. That is what happened in 1987. 1987, JR sent Lelutatulat to Pakistan, hoping that they will open another front in the India Pakistani border. They said, no, we won't. He will send Lelutatulat to China. China said, we are trying to normalize relations with India. We do not want to open. So he had no other option 
except to settle with India. And if you go through the accord and the exchange letters, it means that they will follow a foreign policy in accordance with the Indian wishes. So Balasingham did not answer me at that time. Then five minutes later, we will play havoc. There is one aspect of it. How, see, if you look at the history of the 20th century and the 21st century, those national liberation movements within courts, whether the, the LTT struggle was a national, national liberation movement or a terrorist one, is a debatable one. That I don't know. If it succeeds, it has got externally. The Vietnamese humbled the United States because, because both Soviet Union and China supported them. They had a massive support, but at the same time, they had their own view of the thing and they were willing to go against also both Soviet Union and China. The Mukti Bahini won because India supported. In Sri Lanka had to win, they should have had the Indian support. And they did not have the Indian support after Gaji Gandhi's assassination. We have not yet recovered from the catharsis which took place after the dastardly assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. With India not there, the, and uh, with the supply lines being, uh, being bombed by the Sri Lankan airports because the information that the Indian intelligence provided to them, the LTT naturally will. But till the last moment, those people were believing that there will be international intervention, did not take. But what happened was, what happened was, according to UN sources, 40,000 innocent lives were lost in that war. I can share a secret with you. I was a member of the highest body, National Security Board at that time. I brought the issue of Sri Lanka before them, and I told them, that the innocent people are caught between the Sinhalese lines and the Tamil Tigers, we should rescue them. Enforce a ceasefire so that those who want to leave the clutches of the LTT can escape. Very few sub people supported me. Tirumurthy, who was at that time the Joint Secretary, he was there. And I got the feeling that they do not mind if some innocent lives are lost. The most important thing is the destruction of LTT. Destruction of LTT I also want, but I do not want innocent lives to be lost. And 40,000 lives, even those who showed the white flag of surrender were shot down. And all, and we, uh, we abetted that crime. By abetting that crime, our hands are also tainted with blood. And all the perfumes of Arabia, to quote Lady Macbeth, will not sweeten our dirty hands. So today, what is, the, what is the consequence of so many years of struggle in which Chandrahasan also has played a part? What is the consequence? Today, the Tamil struggle for dignity, Tamil struggle for self-respect, Tamil struggle for devolution of powers have gone back several decades. It is India, <coughs> India's pressure in which Ram also played a big part were Colombo agreed in the India, Sri Lanka, the north and east, the traditional inhabitation. <coughs> Sorry. That has been undone by a judicial pronouncement. They will never get it. Northeast merger is ruled out. In all the development programs that has been taken place, and all the resettlement program that has taken in solving the problems of the ITPs, the elected government of the northern province is not at all consulted. So Tamil struggle today has gone back. Gone back. But the problem of Tamil dignity, self-respect, Tamil discontent continues. How it will take shape has to be seen. I'm always fond of saying that India and Sri Lanka are like Siamese twins. What afflicts one will affect the other. And therefore, it is in India's interest that we have a neighbor who provides sense of security, sense of participation and all. 
I shall conclude my presentation by by one more point. Sorry, I'm taking a lot of it. Last point. If you look at the political developments in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka, they have taken two contradictory courses. In Sri Lanka in 1948, the Tamils were a part of the government. In 1956, when they introduced Sinhala only act, they parked the company and went into non-cooperation. They later demanded a federal state. Then the militants came into existence. So the cooperative, consensual, consociational, competitive, conflictual, conflagration of relationship. In India, as we all know, the Dravidian movement on August 15, 1947, including Karnanandi, hoisted black flags. It was not a day of independence for them, it was a day of slavery. But gradually, the DMK realized, which part of company from the DK, that despite the limitations of the Indian constitution, the constitution provides space for regional parties to come to power, foster, promote, and encourage Tamil identity. So in 1967, they came to power. And since 1967, as you all know, it is the DMK or the AIDM. In 1979, ADMK became a part of the Charan Singh government, and then DMK became a part of the government. As a result of which, what happened during the Fourth Peace War? Karanandi, who was in power, went along with the centre, despite his political gimmicks of a hunger of uh, of a fast and to death after breakfast and stopping it before lunch. Which would go in the Guinness Book of World Records at the shortest hunger strike by any chief minister. They went along with the center. So, you, and today we have a situation in Tamil Nadu where those who once hoisted the black flags and used to burn the constitution every day, absolutely no qualms of conscience in unfurling the national flag on the Independence Day. So, two courses are contradictory. And therefore, we should learn a lesson. Economic development by itself is not going to solve the problem. And economic development is also its own. I will not go into the details of all those things. So it is in India's interest that we have a political system in our neighboring countries where a Tamil can be a Tamil at the same time be a loyal Sri Lankan citizen. And we will have to work for that because we cannot insulate ourselves from the developments in the neighborhood. I've taken a lot of time. This is what happens if you ask a professor to speak. Glory teller also. <laughs> because history comes to his help. Uh, one point I want to mention. Uh, the, uh, his suggestion to the national uh, uh, what you call security advisory group that India should intervene to help the uh, innocent population. Actually, at the time, Americans had sent Marines. Uh, the Bryson Hull from Reuters rang me up. And he met one of the Marines with the advance party who had come to a bar. He told them they were just waiting for the green flag. India, Sri Lanka didn't want and India didn't want Americans to get a foothold. So, it would not be in, in in India's interest at that time to send our troops there. I think this is one thing that weighed on them. And India strongly objected to the US. This came from Bryson Hull to me. And the Americans uh, pulled back. Actually, they had a battalion uh, waiting to just go in into this uh, uh, east of uh, Mullivaikal, where the security zone was there. And uh, the other is, uh, I, I don't think the Sri Lankans, after all the sac sacrifices they have made, both sides, Tamils also, after having lost, the Sri Lanka must have lost 200,000 uh, people at least. Another 200,000 who have lost their houses and uh, homes and property. They are in the same mindset of 1956. This anybody going to Sri Lanka. That, uh, when I went last time, uh, the driver told me, Sir, you want to, at the time, just before the war, 
uh, do you want to go to Elam? The single East driver told me. I said, no, I am not going to Elam, but I want to only hear uh, in Colombo only. Uh, I engaged him for the day. What I say is, the Sinhalese recognized the problem which was not there at that stage. That is why uh, it has, uh, the, that is what is making the uh, fringe, national, nationalist fringe groups much more scared now of Tamils. And uh, we should, Professor, we should distinguish between angst and separatism. That's what has happened in Tamil Nadu. There is a Tamil angst. It is not separatism now. Now, angst, I don't know how to translate it in Tamil. But separatism, all of us are. So, DMK gave up, all the Remedian parties gave up long time back. I have heard uh, Periyar himself speaking uh, and another is speaking. On another is speaking, why he gave up, I have heard. So, that is past. And the question is, they had 12 ministers in the cabinet when the war was on, the Tamil ministers, they did, as Americans say, zilch for the Tamil cause. This is what the others asked me. Actually, I should thank Professor because he raised these critical issues, uh, normally which we generally avoid. We want to be amiable. But the very pertinent questions, these need to be answered. The uh, house is open for your questions. You are welcome to ask any of us or a general question. Yes, uh, Mr. Sundar. Uh, you know, I keep going to Colombo now and then. And whenever I go, I ask, uh, as you said, the driver, or even some better placed people who are in business and so on. And uh, they all say, look, uh, this, this is all the past. There is no problem at all now. You see, you can, if you want to go to Jaffna tomorrow, you go uh, or to Kamali and all those places. It's all very peaceful. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, and somebody even said, you know, my wife is a Tamil. And I speak similarly, she speaks similar to home, and we also speak English. And uh, this is the general position. There is no, this conflict is a thing of the past. Maybe some politicians, you know, in uh, Sri Lanka or in India, the, particularly in Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, the people are keeping it alive. There is no such uh, problem now. That is what they say. They say and we also want to go to India because we want to go to Gaya, we also want to go to, my wife wants to go to Varanasi. I am not trying to generalize this one or two issues, I, I quite talked to the people and I got an impression this is all being, you know, uh, kept alive in uh, Tamil Nadu maybe by people like us and also, you know, the maybe some politicians I don't know in Sri Lanka. Your reaction. Even the book, you know, maybe, you know, is uh, actually uh, yes, I'm keeping it alive. <laughs> yes, he has touched upon this point. Yeah. I would ask him to. Yeah, but, but I wish so, that's all. So I don't want to elaborate on your point. But just one observation about the term Elam. Elam, I think its uh, genesis is from Pali word Ella. So Elam means Sarapadigartha uh, Vandrika. Even in Salapatikaram, you find this term, and then this is this means the entire island. So that is why LTT use Tamil Elam. So the north and the east. That's why. But uh, generally, Elam means uh, the northern northern east. But uh, Elam means Sri Lanka. No. no. I was there for a week, uh, so the second, third, third week of April. Uh, of course, Sinhalese or uh, what I would call Tamil Sununa, generally, there is by and large. My, was, I was there for about 16 months. But Tamil or what's wrong? Masa Masa. people out. 
Well, they, I won't call them, uh, uh, this, by and large, they are not very, what do you call, vicious people. Scenario, you know, average scenario, it's, it's not a vicious people. But uh, Premada is, uh, I, had, uh, I had a very long uh, session with uh, Premada Sadri's secretary, Vijay Dasa. So I, I, I kept on asking him, how Premadasa believed that uh, you know, he could have a truck with uh, you know, alliance with LTT. So his point was this uh, single track approach. He couldn't think. Uh, so I think that, that speaks of more or less uh, the Sinhalese. So uh, I think the people who have met, they are all very, I think, very warm people, I think. Let, 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 let me complete. Let, let me complete my point. This, of course, Sinhalese are all very, what should I say, peace loving and all that. But uh, if you think that there is, uh, of course, this uh, quietness doesn't mean resolution of basic problem. Yeah, of course, there is quietness uh, as of now, but that doesn't mean that the basic uh, causes of the problem have been resolved. So they may get uh, resurfaced at any point of time. So it is in the, I think I, I, I my feeling is uh, there are enough uh, wise and mature leaders in Sri Lankan polity that they can see what will happen after some time. So I think they will respond to the legitimate aspirations of Thomas. It's not that the problems have been solved. Problems have been solved. But of course, the, the, after the May 2009, you have been having a spell of quietness. Quietness doesn't mean peace. No, no, one, one aspect is, no, no, one, one aspect I want to mention is, as he mentioned, functionally, though Tamil is uh, national language, functionally it is, uh, even in Tamil areas they give single East forms. For the grievance committee, no, they, they disappear. Uh, with the disappearance, uh, the, the committee investigating disappearance. They are giving single East forms into fill up. This is a popular complaint among them. That may be a very general. No, 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 that is. Even here. No, 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 it is. You know, don't compare this situation. They had fought a war for 20 years. That is the difference. I'm more or less moving up and down and uh, we are keen on uh, ensuring that the refugees, there's a hundred thousand here who have to go back. And therefore we are convinced that uh, they need to go back and uh, we are convinced that there is so much of space there. One of the issues that comes up is that, is everything all right? I have been there for the last, uh, from 2010, I have been moving up and down for 10 to 12 days in the month I'm there. The fact remains, I haven't seen one single incident of violence. Maybe a coincidence, but over eight years. My contemporaries, even others I meet, even extreme Sinhala politicians, there is a bottom line where they say, enough is enough. If you get close to them, talk to them, they say, enough is enough. And we should not allow things to get back to what did happen. What happened. The Sinhalese people say, it's true that the Tamils uh, may have been the receiving end of violence. But then, as far as the Sinhala people were concerned, six o'clock was curfew for them, for years. So they want peace, that's no question about it. And there's a completely new attitude. Give 
the best chance for reconciliation. Now, South Africa is a good example. There was a truth commission. At the correct time, and they get, went to their feelings and everything came out and they benefited a lot by that. Unfortunately, we have put it, the truth commission in the back burner. That's one of the challenges that is coming up. Can you use this opportunity? What you have heard from the persons is correct. People feel that everything is over, violence is over, it's tranquil, much more quieter than being in Chennai. You will see some incidents in Chennai that it's so quiet. It's true, good to be true. But the fact remains, as the writer has made it relevant, there are basic issues which you have to tackle which will come up in various ways, maybe not by in the same way, in a violent way, but issues have to be solved. That challenge continues to be there. And it is left to the people to see how best they can meet that challenge. But certainly the efforts to encourage reconciliation is very admirable. I hope things could go. The person who is in charge of the whole process has been Chandrika Bandarnaika, who gave the best option in the Sri Lankan parliament when she brought the 2000 constitution. He even went very close to federalism by saying uh, 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 union of regions. She was willing to go that far. Unfortunately, we have a problem of managing the extremists. And uh, the democracy is one vote for each person and the majority, minority, elections, etc. So it's a challenge. But the fact is, it's a golden opportunity and the best must be done. And I am thankful that this book has come out at the correct moment. And in Tamil, a sober contribution so that people can read and understand and get the background. And that's very useful and we must thank the writer for Actually, after the war, I suggested in our TV interaction also, 2000 constitution Tamil should demand to be, because it is Ranil Vikramasinghe who acted against it. He started the Padayatra. Otherwise, it was accepted by all parties. Original. Any other question? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sriram. I am studying international relations at Flame University, Pune, and I am here interning at Chennai Center for China Studies. So, uh, I have two questions. Uh, uh, second question you may wish to answer or not, but first question is, uh, was Rajiv Gandhi very involved in integrity of all the operations or the policy? And if it was the case, was that a mistake or was that a problem? And second question is, uh, since so many, uh, since you are uh, part of uh, military intelligence, I suppose uh, raw military intelligence, IB and naval intelligence were part of the operations there was a synergy between all of them and second thing in second part i'm asking in a geopolitical sense uh, if in case tomorrow we don't have a favorable government in sri lanka do we have that amount of leverage we had two three decades ago thank you i think we will avoid analysis of rajiv it is outside the scope of this uh, thing how rajiv's foreign policy function I, I, I think there is no end otherwise. The second is uh, how military intelligence, IB and r and operated during did our they, intervention. Did they have synergy and do we have that amount of leverage now? No, no. Leverage means what? I mean… We, we, as Sri Lanka, we know everything that happens all the time. At that time, we had uh, coordinated because r and w was uh, external intelligence, MI was there and MI and r and w were coordinating. On this side it was IB. So there was uh, no problem of uh, coordination. And all were… I, I went there as the CDMO's Tamil speaking officer. All of us were Tamil speaking, which is essential for operating. 
we had single snowing officers also and uh, english is there always so it's not uh, there is no problem only thing is uh, there, there was uh, initially there was no bandit i went alone because nobody told us that uh, there would be intelligence requirement i went for three days and came back after three years and i had to build complete intelligence uh, operations i got troops officers posted i got tamil speaking guys so it uh, normally we such greenfield operation takes three years in assam i took two years here that was also a insurgency operation here uh, i was uh, more than familiar than assam and uh, believe it or not ltt itself didn't want many didn't want to fight indian army so i sp- never spent any money for my my ltt sources they themselves voluntarily gave because they wanted the war to end only the leaders ego didn't permit uh, there got to be a query on raji why would be very brief see between 85 and 88 he signed several pacts in the sense punjab accord july 85 and then you had uh, assam accord 85 all this and then uh, 86 i think june mizoram 87 sri lanka and 88 tripura and uh, so he, he genuinely believed that he could solve uh, many of the you know, long standing problems there is he was uh, in my analysis he was very genuine of course he had shortcomings he had weaknesses i am not uh, disputing but he wanted to uh, so- solve all the long standing problems so he might have committed he would have committed mistakes and all right but but he was very genuine okay i just want to supplement what colonel hari has said there were so many agencies which were involved in india sri lanka policy there was the central government there were the armed forces there was the ib there was the raw there was the state government and many of these organizations were working at cross purposes and uh, give you an illustration while the ltt was negotiating with kittu in london the soldiers who have been uh, the ltt guerrillas who were injured as a result of ipk of operations were being brought to trichy and were being treated here uh the kit was running the, in fact the ministry of foreign affairs the sri lanka desk was kept in the dark on some issues even the foreign secretary didn't know but kps menon who was foreign secretary at that time once told me the, he was sitting with rajiv gandhi till about 2 am discussing about pakistan and then 9 am in the morning he gets a phone call from kuldeep sahdev joint secretary the prime minister secretary that rajiv has asked him to go to sri lanka take a special aircraft and go and then shiv shankar men tells him that i was with rajiv gandhi till 2 am he did not tell me So even the father, same thing was true with Sri Lanka also. Bernard Tilagaradne did not know what was happening in, he was a high commissioner, did not know what was happening in Sri Lanka. And sometimes he used to get briefed by our foreign office. Sometimes Dikshit used to lay down the foreign policy. There were so many hands at work and one did not. And one lesson that we can draw from this is that if you want to have a successful neighborhood policy, the organization which are involved should have a uniform policy or should complete directly under one organization the prime minister's secretary at the time uh, uh, foreign ministry also in coordinate because foreign ministry guy came joint secretary one of them i don't want to name him uh, just before operation he said uh, why should we be fighting the ltt sri lanka had uh, voted so many times in un along with india and i asked him what is the strategic aim 
of IPKR. So when I asked this question, when uh, late Sundati addressed us, he threw me out. He says, I gave three years assessment. That operation will take three years. But they, uh, they told me, uh, who is the guy who gave this assessment? My assessments are going directly to ISG. I asked, please step out. Totally, this is the, before operation it was like this. Rod didn't coordinate with us because it was dealing directly with PM. I was, uh, our operation was under defense ministry. But once we started operation, at local level, I have always worked with Roy and IB. I have no enmity because we deal personally. It's personality based. So it was like that. This is the fault of Rajiv Gandhi's style of Bodo Accord created more problems. I know because I had to face them in Assam. How this issue, long wall issue, still it is uh, this thing. So it gave a facade of Rajiv Gandhi. He has a great charisma, the young uh, cavalier coming and resolving all issues. But it didn't happen like that because uh, these are very complex problems. There is a historical thing to answer since Rajiv Gandhi's issue has come up. I am answering this. I wanted to avoid this. But uh, his point is very right. Uh, because I insisted that every ship going back empty, which brings supplies, they should take our casualties. The, the people of India must see the price they are paying. I was asked to get out. It is not your subject. That was a political decision. Apparently, the army was implemented. We can carry on like this forever. So, only a forum anyway. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, please. I think this should be the last question, as it is dwindling audience. Uh, I have been curious. I have a question for Mr. Chandra, but anybody else? I've been mean, curious about the relationship that the Sri Lankan Tamils feel towards the Tamils in Tamil Nadu. Uh, I get some sense that India, how Sri Lanka sees India from all your conversations, thank you for that, about but this sort of minor ethnic relationship between the Tamils there and the Tamils here, what is the perception from the Sri Lankan Tamils end? I mean, do they feel we have contributed? Clearly we haven't, but thank you. I, I believe the uh, professor wants to have his last say. After that, we will disperse. I want, before that, I want to thank uh, uh, Sashi Nair. Okay. He wants me to thank the lady. I just want to give you one remarkable illustration. It was well known when Raji Gandhi died. Within a couple of days, the LTT had a hand in it. But no Sri Lankan Tamil was harmed in Tamil Nadu. All the harm was done to the DMK. You know, Karnandi's statue was brought down in Mount Road, DMK office. And you contrast this with what happened in Delhi when Indira Gandhi died, how the Sikhs were massacred. So, it is both ways. Uh, Tandrahasan spoke about the response to the tsunami, like the, I have the only other section of the people who did very yeoman work at that time with RSS volunteers and the refugees also came. But Tamil Nadu also uh, showed by not, because if violence had started against the refugees, it would have been very, very bad. But it did not happen. And look at Delhi, that is what I am saying. After Indira Gandhi said, the Sikh community was massacred. But Uh, I, I thank uh, uh, Mr. Sashi Nayar for providing an opportunity for us and uh, for this book release. It was really a uh, walk back to our past. And I thank the audience also. Now over to Mr. Sashi.